Well, as I shared with you by means of uh, correspondence, by text uh, earlier today, if you have a, a cell phone, I shared uh, information that way from time to time. On Wednesday nights, we're beginning a brand new series, and we're going to be dealing with heaven. You know, uh, when you stop and think about it, heaven is going to be our eternal home. You're going to live there forever and forever and forever. And if there's one thing that you and I as Christians need to know, we need to understand a little bit more about heaven or as much as we can according to what Scripture says. And so that's what we're going to be doing on Wednesday nights. We're going to be dealing with intently and very uh, deliberately, as much in depth as we can, what does the Bible say about heaven? What does God want you and me to know whenever it comes to heaven? Now, if you'll take your Bible and turn to the book of uh, Hebrews, uh, chapter uh, 9 and also uh, chapter uh, uh, chapter 12. We'll get into that in just a moment, but I want you to listen to the testimony of a great saint of God who was getting ready to leave this world, and he was getting ready to go out into heaven. Uh, D.L. Moody was one of the greatest evangelists of uh, the 19th century. He was, in his day, the Billy Graham, uh, preaching uh, to more people, at least in his day and time, uh, as, as Dr. Graham has in this generation, to all as, as far as people that were living seen by more people in his generation and his age. A great evangelist to the Americas and also used greatly in Europe. But whenever he was getting ready to walk out of this life, I want you to listen to a testimony uh, from uh, D.L. Moody. Uh, you know, here's the record of it. A few hours before entering what he called the homeland, Dwight Moody caught a glimpse of the glory awaiting him. Awakened from a sleep, he said, Earth recedes, heaven opens before me. If this is death, it is sweet. There is no valley here. God is calling me and I must go. His son was standing by him and uh, said to him, he said, Father, you're dreaming. And he said, no, I'm not dreaming. I've seen, I've been within the gates. I've seen the children's faces. A short time elapsed and then following what seemed to be a, the family to be death struggle, he spoke again and this was one of the last things that he said. This is my triumph. This is my coronation day. It is glorious. Those were the last words of D.L. Moody before he went into heaven. And the truth about it is we need to understand what God has to say to us from his word about heaven. So many people have shared experiences uh, about heaven, about going to heaven. You've heard me preach many times uh, through the years about heaven. But for the next few Wednesday nights, we want to be intent. Because the truth about it is, a lot of people, you don't hear a great deal of people talking about, about heaven anymore. As a matter of fact, you don't even hear a lot of saints of God talking about looking forward to going he to heaven. A lot of folks are just looking forward to what they can get in this life. And you really even don't hear a lot of pulpits talking about heaven. Because we're not a society that wants delayed gratification anymore. In other words, we want instant gratification. We want what we want. We want it right now. And as far as thinking about heaven, waiting for heaven, you know, well, I want to have the car now, and I want to go to the Bahamas, and I want to go to Hawaii, and I want to go do all these things. And then when I get to the point that I can't do a single thing else, lift a finger, then is when I want to go to heaven. And I can understand that. But you and I need to get a biblical compass on heaven and what we're looking forward to. Well, in Hebrews chapter 9 and also chapter 12 and then all the way back to the Gospel of Luke, I want you just to listen to these verses. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 24. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And then if you'll turn over to the 12th chapter and verse 23. Listen to what Scripture has to say. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the just men made perfect. In other words, the Hebrew writer is saying, to the church of the firstborn, which is written, or which are in heaven. And if you'll go back to the... Uh, uh, New Testament, turn to the book of Gospel of Luke for just a moment. Gospel of Luke chapter 10, and I want you to look in verse uh, 20. 
as we get into the, uh, uh, the study tonight. Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I want to read that one one more time. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but I love to know the fact that my name is written down in heaven. Whenever you go throughout the Bible, you will discover a number of things uh, whenever you just do a study on heaven. First of all, if you'll look at the overhead, heaven is mentioned better than 550 times in Scripture. As a matter of fact, it depends on uh, uh, which, uh, I guess you could say, which guide you're following. Uh, because uh, some will use 550, some will use 600, and, uh, and more than that. And uh, God makes it very clear that He wants us to know about heaven. As a matter of fact, whenever you will listen to Jesus very carefully in the Gospels, you will notice that Jesus takes deliberate intentionality in telling you and me about heaven. Well, not only does God want us to know about heaven... But he wants us to understand and he wants us to rejoice that our name is written in heaven. You know, whenever you look at uh, the text in, in Luke chapter uh, 10 verse 20, he says, I want you to rejoice. I want you to rejoice that your name is written in heaven and I want you to understand that. Now, 238 times in the New Testament is the word heaven mentioned. Well, I want you to notice another, uh, the other point whenever she mashes and see the next point up there. Heaven is our eternal home. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that you have an eternal home. It is not a time place. It is not another place like this place. It is completely different than the earth. And uh, also, as I just mentioned, we're to rejoice that our names are written in heaven. Now, tonight I'm going to give you as, in, as intentional of introduction, and then we're going to get very intent into the study... But, uh, you know, Jesus makes it very clear. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us whenever we pray, we're to pray our Father which art in heaven. Why did Jesus say, pray our Father which art in heaven? Why didn't he just say, pray to our Father? Because he wants you and me to know where the Father is located. He wants you and me to know that the Father is in heaven. In another location, Jesus makes it very clear, and I just read it to you, that you and I are to rejoice. We're to rejoice that uh, uh, our name is written in, in heaven and that's where we're going to live. As a matter of fact, before I get to point one, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 12, Rejoice in being exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. Now when you get worn out, now I want you to listen to me real carefully. I want you to listen. When you get real worn out in life and you get worn out in work and you get worn out in this dimension of life, God says, I want you to understand that your reward is not down here. Your reward is not in people observing you, recognizing you, or even compensation. He said, I want you to understand your reward is in heaven. So, something you and I need to understand as we study about heaven. First of all, heaven is real because it's the throne of holy God. Now, sometimes somebody will come along... And they'll say, you know what, they'll, they'll just sort of try to lead you and me to believe that it's sort of a, a mythological place. It's a state of mind. It's a state of your emotional being. It is a good place to have whenever you've got family that's dying. It's good to know they're going to a good place. Well, I wish I could say that about everybody that dies, but that's not the case. And, uh, but I want you to listen to what uh, Jesus says in Matthew uh, 5.34. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven. Why? Because it is God's throne. Now, I want you to answer me a question. How can heaven be God's throne and be His house and yet nothing... You know, God doesn't live completely in one location. You can't house God. You know, the Bible said it's His throne and that's exactly right. Well, it's sort of like you. You know, your house is where you live, but it don't impact all of your influence. Your impact, your life, your living is not uh, confined to your house, to 
the four walls or to your home structure, your life, your influence, your witness goes far beyond that. So, first of all, heaven is real for it's the place of God's throne. First of all, heaven is not a state of mind. Now, Jesus, whenever he speaks all throughout the Gospels, remember when Jesus was speaking that these disciples were hearing things they had never heard uh, like Jesus spoke. As a matter of fact, Jesus calls heaven a place. Uh, when you go to uh, John chapter 14, you don't have to do that there now. But he said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. In other words, it's a place. As a matter of fact, uh, the word house comes from the word oikia. And the word oikia literally means an abode. A literal physical place of abode. And uh, heaven is not going to be just a state of mind. It's not just going to be a fanciful uh, mythological, shadowy place where there's just, uh, uh, you know, clouds and we're going to sit on clouds. That is not what the Bible teaches. Uh, heaven is not a state of mind. But second of all, heaven is pure, holy, and completely righteous. Now, if you stop and think about it, the Bible says it is the place where uh, it's the throne of God. It is the abode of God. That's why you have to be redeemed and I have to be redeemed so we can enter heaven. There is not one molecule of sin in heaven. It, it just can't enter in. That's why unless a person is changed, God is not going to change heaven so people can get into it. He is not going to change his standard just so our nice friends get into heaven. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll perish. And, uh, you know... There is within heaven no sin, no defilement. And, and it's not a world better than this world. It's a world different than this world. And here's, here's one of the ways to try to explain. You and I are locked in to time. We have morning, we have evening, we have evening, we have morning. We're locked into age. You're not going to be locked in to age in heaven. You're not even going to be locked in to time. You're not even going to be locked in to your ability to you know, move one foot after the other. You know, one of the ways that you're going to exit this building tonight, you're going to get up, you're going to move one foot in front of the other, and you're going to exit the building. You're going to get in your car, and you're going to go at whatever speed you want to, going home safely. And, but you're limited. You're limited to your humanity. You're limited to what your body can do. And uh, in part of the study that I'm going to get, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how you're going to travel in heaven. I'm not going to do that tonight. I want to save that for a little bit later. Give you some ideas so you'll know how you're going to travel. Give you some glimpses into, uh, from Scripture. And so, Scripture refers to three different heavens. Now, whenever you look in Scripture, Isaiah 63, 15 declares that the Lord looks down from heaven. There are three heavens that uh, exist. First of all is the atmospheric heaven. It's the heaven right above us. And, uh, you know, where the rain comes down and the clouds abide. And uh, it's the atmospheric heaven. And then there's the planetary heaven, the heaven that is beyond uh, the clouds. You know, if you've ever flown, some, when you're a kid, you realize, man, those clouds are way up there. Well, if you've ever flown, you realize those clouds aren't very high at all. And all of a sudden, you're up above the clouds, and you're looking way down on the clouds. And I used to wonder when I was a kid, and it'd be a real rainy day, I thought, I feel so sorry for that person. They're taking sunglasses with them. They must not be with it. And then whenever you fly and you get up above the clouds, you realize you better have you some sunglasses because it's bright. And, uh, and then the planetary heaven, you know, where the planets are, the stars are, the, the galaxies are. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you can get into numbers that will be on your comprehension and my comprehension. That's the second heaven. And then there's the third heaven. The third heaven is uh, where, uh, where Paul makes it very clear that he was caught up to. And uh, so in a world where there's a lot of people that are duping and deceiving and saying, well, now heaven is just a figment of your imagination. By the time you get to the end of this study, you're going to realize, and the end of these messages, you're going to realize in a very deliberate way what heaven is, where you're going, what you're going to be doing, and some of your assignments in heaven. And, uh, and so, as I mentioned, the reason we have to be changed by the blood of Jesus Christ is because no defilement can enter into heaven. So, you know, it's not just a better world. It's a different world. It's a world where you are going to be completely different. And, and Jesus gives us some examples from the world we live in to just sort of get an idea. You've watched caterpillars. 
you know, uh, uh, that are just sort of walking around. They're just crawling around. And, and then those caterpillars get in a cocoon and they become a butterfly. Well, they're not limited to uh, ground anymore. They're, they're different. They're flying around. And I really believe that's the Lord giving you and me a little bit of uh, insight into what we're going to be able to do into your traveling capabilities when you and I get into heaven. Well, second of all, heaven is real because Jesus testifies of heaven. Now, I wish I had time just to go verse by verse by verse into all the verses that Jesus uses about heaven. As I mentioned, 238 times in the New Testament, you'll find the word heaven mentioned. And uh, Jesus knew well that uh, uh, whenever it came to heaven, he knew the disciples needed to understand as they were going to teach and preach and be his servants, and they were going to be propelled, and, and they needed to tell others the truth. And so Jesus commanded his disciples to let their light shine. Why? In order that people could see their good works and glorify their Father. But Jesus didn't stop there. He said that they may glorify your Father, what? Who is in heaven. In other words, Jesus said to the disciples, I want to give you a, I want you to understand where the Father is. As a matter of fact, second, Jesus declared in Matthew 6, 1, and you can turn back there if, uh, if you'd like to. In uh, Matthew chapter 6, and uh, I want you just to look at the text for just a, just a second. Matthew 6, 1. Take heed that you know not do your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father. And Jesus didn't stop there. He said, of your Father, which is in heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying to the disciples again, I want you to know where your Father is. I want you to understand, not only is God there, that's the throne of God. Not only is He there, but the Lord Jesus is there. And here's the thing about it. When you get to heaven, you're going to meet a myriad of saints from the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's where the Old Testament saints are. It's where the New Testament saints are. And so uh, Jesus makes it very clear. We're to practice uh, righteousness privately so that our Father who's in heaven can see us. And, and so he's speaking of the Father in heaven. And uh, in the Gospels alone, the reference to heaven is made 130 times. 130 times in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, Jesus is making it clear the, to the apostles, to the early saints of God, to those who would be the beginning of the church. Why? Because, listen, when the days get dark, when life gets difficult, when things get black, we need to understand the truth of God, and the truth of God is this that those who are born of the Spirit of God have an eternal home, and that eternal home is in heaven. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, He said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And uh, the word paradise uh, just carried the idea of lush, green, beautiful uh, scenery and, and gardens. And so Jesus made it clear that uh, if it weren't so, He said, First of all, if, if there was no heaven, I would have told you. And here's why. Jesus, it is impossible for God to lie. You see, you and I ought to tell the truth. We should tell the truth. But we don't always tell the truth. Have you ever lied? Well, let me give you an example. Husbands, have your wives ever come... Well, has your wives, not wives, wife. Has your wife ever come in and said, Do these shoes look good? Do they go with this outfit? Do you like this outfit? Well, we always say little white lie. And here's the point. There is the propensity, the capability inside of every one of us to lie. It is within your ability to lie. Do you realize it is not even within the capability of the nature of holy God, of God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? There is no capability, no Ability whatsoever in his being nature to ever say something false. It's just not there. And that's why Jesus said, if it wasn't so, I would have told you. In other words, I'm going to always speak to you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. And that's the way it is. And so, all throughout the Gospels, Jesus speaks of heaven. Why? Because we need to know. It's amazing what people have believed about heaven. I heard somebody say to me, it wasn't too long ago, maybe a couple years ago, 
And they said, now, Pastor, it is right that a person's spirit floats around for three days before they go on into eternity, right? And I said, would you say that again? They said, it is right a person's spirit floats around for three days before they go on into eternity. I didn't understand what they were saying. And then, lo and behold, I started doing some studying and hundreds of years ago, that's what some of the early saints believed. That's what, because think about it. You know, they'd be, they'd be told something and they'd embrace it. That's why whenever Jesus came on the scenes, physically in bodily form, God in the flesh, and spoke to the apostles, spoke to the church, he spoke things that they had never understood and never heard. Show me in the Old Testament where heaven is really expounded. While it's found 550 times, in the New Testament is where it's expounded. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul takes great time in 2 Corinthians to speak of it. And so all throughout the gospel, Jesus speaks of it. But uh, as a matter of fact, he just said, whoever denies him, then, then Jesus will deny that person before the Father who's in heaven. Do you realize Jesus said, if you'll be ashamed of me in this world... I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. Folks, that's reason enough to stand bold, to stand up, to stand out, to, and to say, you know what, I don't care what the world says, I'm going to stand for the truth of God. And so, uh, you know, and, and, and we're facing difficult days. It's going to get worse for the church. It's not going to get better. Why do I know that? Because I know what the book of the Revelation says. I know that things are going to get dark. Things are going to get very dark. Things are going to get extremely dark. And then the Lord's going to come. But you and I need to hold on to the truth, and we need to learn the truth, and we need to know the truth about heaven. So second of all, heaven is real, for Jesus testifies to its reality. And then third, heaven is real because the testimony of many of the redeemed. Now, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians for just a moment. And uh, I want to get partially into this. I may not have time to completely uh, cover it. But in, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, all throughout human history, you know, many have uh, talked about experiences, about going to heaven. And uh, whenever uh, uh, Paul, in 2 Timothy, he speaks, as a matter of fact, you don't even know this is Paul the Apostle. He cloaks his language in such humility that he doesn't want you to know that it was him that was taken up into the third heaven. But I want you to listen because this is an experiential account of Paul the Apostle being taken up into heaven. Now, I knew a man, verse 2, in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body... I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. Now, I want you to stop right there. He said, I know a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. Do you realize, now I want you to listen real carefully. Do you realize the moment that the Lord takes you, that it's going to be in such a wonderful, sweet way, that you probably won't even realize you're out of the body? Paul said, I know a man who is caught up into heaven. Now, he probably, 60s or so, somewhere there about 70s. But here's what he said, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. Have you ever had a dream so real you thought you was in the body? Have you ever had something happen so real and you realize you woke up that it was a dream? And so he says, I can't tell, God knows. In other words, he said, I don't know if God caught me up with my body or if my body was here in my spirit. He said, I don't know. He said, I don't know if I had this body. He said, it was such a wonderful transition. I don't, don't know. But watch what he says. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth. How he was caught up. Now watch this. He was caught up into paradise. Now, Paul, why do you use the word paradise? Paradise. Paradise was the highest word of beauty, of holiness, of majesty that there was in the Greek language in the days of Paul. And Paul said, I was caught up into paradise. And here's what he said. I heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one I will glory, yet uh, of myself I will not glory in mine infirmities. Now... 
Now, Paul is saying, I know someone, I know someone who is caught up. In other words, he said, I saw some things. I heard some things. I experienced some things. And folks, all of those are reminders that, number one, we're going to have a new body. And for you to see something, you have to have eyes. For you to hear something, you have to have ears. For you to experience something, you have to have some type of nerve endings. I mean, there has to be some of those things present in, in your being. And so, and Paul, you know, he wasn't a scientist, but Paul made it very clear. You know, he said, I was caught up. And, uh, and he said, I wasn't caught up to the clouds. He said, I wasn't caught up to the planets. He said, I was caught up to paradise, to heaven. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, the first heaven, what it is, the atmospheric, the second planetary, and the divine heaven, the, the place where God is. And uh, the testimony of Paul is that there was a taking up. So that would let you know that Paul was not taken down. Now, why is it that every one of us, we know within our being, when, uh, where are you going to go when you die? Ask a child, where are you going to go? They may not say the word because they don't want to say the word. They'll go like this or they'll go like this. Do you know that it is programmed into your DNA because God has made you that your default disposition knows the location of where heaven is? You don't know exactly where it is out there, but you know it's up. You know, I have never said, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. It's always, I'm going to heaven. Matter of fact, people, if you've been around someone who's passed away, uh, Paul may, or, you know, you find they may even gaze up. They may even look up. Now, you know, Paul uses the word paradise. And the word literally means a land cultivated or elevated and cultivated. In other words, trees and shrubs and grass and, and utter beauty. You know, you've been someplace and you say, man, that place is just heaven. And I've had some people say, man, you need to go there. And they'll start saying all sorts of things and I can't comprehend what they're saying. I said, no, it can't really look like that. And then I'll see it or see a picture of it and I'll say, you're exactly right. And that's why you're going to have to have a different person or not, a different disposition so you can embrace all of heaven. Uh, number one, your body can't embrace all of heaven. And so... Uh, you know, the wonder of Paul's testimony is the fact that he saw what was real, what was true. And he said uh, it was the paradise of God. You're going to see it. And uh, as a matter of fact, there's, there, there are some things in Scripture that really are, are silent. For example, sometimes somebody will say, Now, Pastor, whenever you die and go to be with the Lord, what type of body do you have? In other words, when you die immediately and go to, the, to be with the Lord... What type of body do you have? And my simplest answer is, I don't know. You know why? Because the Bible is silent. The Bible doesn't tell you immediately when you die and when you go to be with the Lord what, what you have. Now, the Bible does say that the Lord is going to give us a brand new body. This body that dies, this body right here, is going to be raised up. That's why... This body is significant. This body is going to be raised up and this body is going to be changed. Paul put it this way. This mortal is going to be changed immortality. This flesh is going to be changed uh, to uh, immortal nature. And it's going to happen faster than you can clap your hands or faster than you can blink your eyes. But if somebody asks you, so what type of body do you have immediately after you die and go to heaven? The Bible is silent. And... and and I really, I've wondered why the Bible is silent, but God knows what he's doing. And so, uh, in the final days of Paul's life, if you listen to Paul carefully, listen to what he said. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Paul is not saying, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. It's like he is anxious to jump into heaven. Why not? Why wouldn't you want to go to a place that's absolutely perfect? Where there's no sinners, there's no sinning, there's no ungodliness, nothing like that. Only the redeemed of God. And, uh, and you know, you stop and think about it. You give your life to the Lord, your body's racked in pain. And I'm around people that uh, pass away, and some of you are too. 
But I don't really feel sorry at all for a person who served the Lord and given themselves to the Lord. I mean, it's a, it's a great release and a great relief. But uh, so, and, and fourthly, heaven is real because one thing inside of every one of us. Do you notice yourself longing for heaven sometimes? The more wicked this world gets, you know, I, I think I can say this honestly before the Lord. And before you. If the Lord said, Benny, you can live to be 500 years old. Do you want it? I really don't think in this world I would want that. Would you? Now, I, I don't know what I would say if the Lord said that. Of course, I, that's not going to happen. But, uh, and, you know, probably 80, 90, 100, you know, maybe 105, 110. I think the oldest man in the world is 130. And uh, imagine what he's seen in his lifetime. But uh, there's a longing inside of us. And let me explain to you why. When you were saved, the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit came to abide on the inside of you. And the Holy Spirit is the earnest. Have you ever had somebody who's given you earnest money? You know, they say, I'll buy that car. And you say, okay, if you buy that car, I need, I need some earnest money. I need some money that says you're going to do what you say. And they give you some money. Well, they may not come through, but here's what God does. He said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the pledge that I'm going to follow through with what I'm going to do. I'm going to come and get you. Jesus said, I'm going to come and get you. I'm going to step out from heaven. And if you was here for the study of the Revelation, you have an idea what's going to happen, or study of the rapture. The Lord is going to come. He's going to step out of heaven. He's going to come on the air. And the church is going to be taken up to go with the, be with the Lord. And after that, there's going to be a time of rewarding for the saints of God. And then there's going to be great tribulation on the earth. And then he's going to come back with his saints. But we're going to be taken up into heaven. And uh, because that's what God's designed. And, uh, you know, and, and the reality of it is, is that if you're going to really, really, uh, you know, enjoy the life that God purposed, there has to be that longing. And if you don't ever long for heaven, you really need to back up and ask, now, wait a minute, why don't I long for heaven? And there's a lot of folks who are not genuinely, authentically redeemed. And they don't have any longing for heaven. They don't want to go to heaven. They don't, because, and you need to ask, why? Why don't you ever want to go to heaven? And so it's real because there's a longing inside of our hearts. As a matter of fact, Jesus said in John 17, you don't have to turn there. But he said, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory, which you've given me, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Do you realize one of the last prayers that Jesus prayed for you before he was taken back up into heaven, he said, Father, I want them to come home and be with me. Now, do you understand that Jesus is saying to the Father, I want them to see what I'm seeing. I want them to experience what, what you have. Not a state of mind. And I want you to understand it's not a state of mind. It's not a state of emotional being, psychological being. It is an actual, real place just as real as this city is real, as this place is real, so is the reality of heaven. And then number five, and you know this as well as I do, but I just want to remind us of this. Heaven is real, but entrance is only for those who've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. You know, sometimes you'll come around somebody and I'll, I'll see someone and say, you know what, I'm just so glad my great-grandmother and this person and that person, you know, I just can't wait until till we all get to heaven. And there is a song we sing when we all get to heaven. And I understand the disposition of that song because it's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we're all not getting to heaven. And Jesus made it very clear. You know, you remember there were two thieves on the cross beside Jesus. The Bible doesn't say which was on the right or which was on the left. But there was one, cross, one thief that had no uh, conversation with Jesus and that Jesus had no conversation with. He didn't say you're going to enter into paradise. He didn't say you're going to be with me in heaven. As a matter of fact, let me say this and echo this again. 
The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is always smaller than the congregation that meets. Sometimes we think, man, what's wrong with people? Well, what's wrong with people? A lot of people have a fake salvation. If you don't long in your heart somewhere down the road to want to be in heaven, to want to see the Lord, to be with Him, then you need to go back and say, have I authentically been saved, been redeemed by the blood of Christ? As a matter of fact, John 3, 3 says, except a man be born again. He can't see the kingdom of God. In other words, it's not going to be possible to see it, to enter into it, to experience it. Jesus said, unless a man's born again. And uh, Jesus also said in Luke 13, 5, I tell you nay, but except you repent. What does repent mean? Unless you turn from your wickedness and turn to Jesus Christ. Unless you turn away from sin and turn to the Lord. And, uh, you know, and folks, there's a lot of people who desire to go to heaven, but they're not going to heaven. And, and the reality of it is, is that we need to be mindful that just because a person wants to go to heaven, wants to live in a perfect world. I mean, everybody under God's son wants to live in a perfect world. Everybody wants to live in a world where there's no problems. But the truth about it is, when it comes to placing faith in Jesus Christ and, and being cleansed and being forgiven of sin... A lot of people say, you know, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I want to live like the devil and live like torment, and I want to have my little hell on earth. And then, well, there's no promise of that. That's why Jesus said, don't rejoice that demons are subject to you. Don't rejoice that Satan is subject to you. Don't rejoice that the cohorts of hell are subject to you because you and I have Christ living on the inside of us. But he said, here's what you rejoice. Rejoice that your name. Did you get that? Your name is written in heaven. And the truth about it is, as you and I study about heaven and as we look deep in the scriptures, what God has to say, and we're going to, like I said, we're going to deal with a lot of things. What are we going to do? What are some of our assignments? What's... What else is in heaven? Uh, how are we going to travel in heaven? Uh, but the most important thing is that you know you're going to heaven. You see, there's some folks who say, you know, I want to go to heaven. You know, there was a song that was sung some years ago. It was a secular song. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to, to die. Now, we may be the terminal generation that don't die. You say, Pastor? Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. We may be the last generation of the earth. Think about it. Are you watching the clock tick according to Scripture? Are you seeing the things that are being fulfilled according to Scripture? We may be the terminal generation. And the Lord may come and take us. But here's the point. You need to understand when things get hard... Jesus said, don't lay up treasure for yourself where moth and rust corrupt and thieves break. But he said, lay up for yourselves treasure. Listen to the word. Lay up for who? Yourselves. Treasure. How do you lay up treasure in heaven? By faithful, godly, obedient walk unto the Lord. And you know what? Serving him. There's an implication in scripture, and I won't get into that. But do you realize James and John said to Jesus one time, said, let us sit on the right hand. Let us sit on the right hand in the throne. Because, by the way, do you realize that there's going to be ruling and reigning? Yes, there is. There's going to... But Jesus said, that's not for me to give. In other words, the implication is they're the persons who are the most uh, suffering individuals who suffer the most for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not talking about suffering in a church service. I know some people would say, man, I've suffered a lot in church services. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about genuine, authentic suffering where you are right through everything under God's Son because you name the name of Christ and you stand on the Word of God. Jesus said, rejoice. Rejoice when people say all kinds of evil against you. Rejoice in me and be glad. Listen to what Jesus For great is your reward locked up in heaven. In other words, he said, I want you to understand, God the Father is there, God the Son's there,
The saints of the Old Testament are there. The New Testament saints are there. But your reward is there. Imagine the day comes and you walk out of this life. Now let me use just a real simple, humble analogy. You walk out of this life and you walk into heaven. You've not given the Lord much. You've not done much for the Lord. Not devoted much. And all of a sudden, the Lord takes you over and He shows you, let's just say, a box. And then someone else dies and serves the Lord and, and they're taken and they're shown a a huge, 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 huge warehouse of boxes. You say, what's the difference? That one person has been watched by the Lord and he didn't do very much. He got a box. This other person had many rewards, served the Lord faithfully, and the ware- and the warehouse couldn't house all his works. It was a warehouse full of wonderful reward. Now, folks, that's a very humble, humble analogy. But here's what Jesus says. He said, when you suffer, when you're ostracized, when you're rebuked, when you think nobody cares, he says, when people say all kinds of evil about you, he said, you rejoice because I want to tell you this. Not only are you going to go to heaven, but your reward is there. Live faithfully. Live obediently. Live yielding yourself. Live working. Die climbing. Die serving. Die giving. There's nothing like that saint of God who says, you know what? I don't care who quits. I'm not quitting. I remember Mr. Gray Stoke. I remember the story. You never knew Mr. Gray Stoke and neither did I. Mr. Gray Stoke was an Englishman. Mr. Greystoke was in his 90s. Mr. Greystoke could not see. He could not hear. He could barely get around. But Mr. Greystoke made it his business to be found in the house of God regularly and faithfully. And when hollering at him, you could get him to hear, and they said, Mr. Greystoke, why? Why do you come? You can't hear. You can't see. And here's what he said. It's my witness unto the Lord. Now think about it. It's your witness unto the Lord when people see you serving, when people see you faithful. And he says, don't forget. I can't forget. Not one molecule of service have you rendered to the Lord that God has forgotten from the very first day you got saved. I dare say if I was to try to count up all the sandwiches that the kitchen staff had served and all the lessons that teachers had served and all the hours that people have given in ministry service, I couldn't come close. And the Lord says, I know exactly. And they're here. You don't get them yet, but you'll get them when you arrive in heaven.